Good morning, everyone. I, I appreciate you being here on such a glorious day when you'd rather be outside, I'm quite sure, and enjoying the weather. But since you're here, I am going to tell you about my family business. And my great-grandfather came over from Mecklenburg, Germany, and started, well, not started, because now that I've got you captive, oh, I'm sorry, can I just move that? Thank you. Um, actually, the Dundee Brickyard started in 1852. So we're really 162 years old because my great-grandfather purchased that brickyard and, um, in 1871, which was because of the Chicago fire. And naturally, Chicago was going to be building again with non-flammable building material this time instead of wood. They wanted brick and steel and so on. And so these were the kinds of bricks that were being manufactured at the Dundee Brickyard, which is just literally four blocks down the bike path. If you've not been to Hager, you must come down and see because it is an historic site. It's just where we've been ever since the beginning. And these are the kinds of bricks. They're the cream-colored bricks. There are many buildings in this area that have been constructed of these. And uh, the, the school in West Dundee that used to be the grade school. The Lutheran Church over here on the corner. Uh, many, many buildings around here have Hager brick. But the main thing was that in that era, because of the Chicago fire, my great-grandfather had to really gear up and produce bricks for the rebuilding of the city. It was critical because this was the reconstruction era let me paint a little picture here. This was six years after the Civil War had ended. That's how long back this goes. So you can imagine the upheaval that was going on in the country. And they were trying to reindustrialize and get the economy moving because of the war had been so devastating. And I just have a few things of, of note that I looked up. In 1856, before the Chicago fire, Louis Pasteur invented pasteurization. That's how recent that was at that time, to have good foods and dairy products that weren't, you know, full of some bacteria. So um, my great-grandfather is carrying on now with the business, gearing up, helping supply the city. And then, don't you know, there's an 1873 depression. It's called the Panic of 1873. It was nationwide, but really mainly in the South because the South industry was very harmed after the slaves had been freed and no one was there to take care of the cotton. So they had to industrialize there and that took a long time to get that going. So the Depression um, swept the country, but because fortunately we were in this reconstruction mode, uh, it really was a very quick depression and the boon started to happen. Another interesting thing, 1873, two years after my great-grandfather was starting the reconstruction or helping in the reconstruction of Chicago, Levi Strauss invented the blue jeans <laughs> with copper rivets at the pockets so that they didn't split open. So the working people had good, solid working pants to be able to wear and I thought that was interesting. And of course, 1876, the telephone was patented. So it just puts you back in an era. I mean, we're so used to our modern day marvels. You have to realize what people were dealing with back then. Um, the light bulb came on, in, <laughs> literally, in 1879. 1880, you're going to like this, perforated toilet paper. <laughs> And 1893, lo and behold, we got the zipper by W.L. Jackson. So, you know, imagine these things we take for granted, and those are conveniences that were a real boon to everyone at that time. So, uh, as the time went on and my great-grandfather continued to survive and thrive, growing the business, 
By 1900, unfortunately, he had fallen ill. And one morning, it was discovered, of course, that in the newspaper, the community read that he had died. All the businesses in the town were closed in honor of him because he had been so involved in the community in so many different ways. And uh, my grandfather, Edmund Hager, who was still in college at the time, found himself taking over the business. And they continued on with my great-grandfather's goal of helping rebuild not only the city, but by now they were building here and uh, drain tile for the fields to help the farmers make the fields more fertile. By drain, putting drain tile through, they were able to take swampy, boggy areas and dry them out and make them productive. But then along came Franz Koenig, another good German, and he decided that perhaps we could begin to expand into flower pots, glazed, <laughs> simple glazed flower pots. And I don't have one of those here because we don't have those old flower pots. And as they got on in deciding to expand the flower pot line and get into more decorative arts, along came Adam. Adam was the first artware piece that we designed in 1914. This was introduced. And then came Eve. <laughs> now, what does that say about male chauvinism? I want to know. But they're really classic pieces. These were uh, part of the arts and crafts era with the severe lines, but they're still contemporary today, and we still make these pieces today because they have been so popular. Along the lines of the florist industry, we began, as you can see, uh, the florist kinds of wear, but we got them more highly decorated as the sophistication grew in the ceramics and the glazing process. This was called green gold tweed. It, the gold is actually an 18 karat gold that is brushed across the surface of the glaze. And uh, these are quite valuable if you find them out in the marketplace. Okay, now we're moving forward to when my father got involved in the business. So now it wasn't the direct line, it was the marriage that came into being. And my father, Joseph Estes, married my mother, obviously, who uh, she is the granddaughter of Edmund, or granddaughter, yeah, granddaughter of Ed, of, sorry, the daughter of Edmund, gotcha. And soon they found a designer by the name of Royal Hickman, who began to make more fanciful kinds of designs out of feathers and leaves and animals and mermaids and all kinds of things because people were very tired of the arts and crafts, the sort of the strict, more delineated, geometric looking things. They wanted more fun and fancy. So in came the Art Nouveau era. And as you can see, he would take the powder pigeon and really make it something. And uh, in one of the books that has been written about Hager, this was likened to Mae West. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> but Royal Hickman was the designer who brought this all to bear. And his iconic piece is the stalking Black Panther. This piece is still being produced today. It is just a remarkably, wonderfully amazing piece. It looks like that guy is just going to come right off the table at you. But what you have to notice with this particular piece, the tail comes out this way. If you find one of these, and it's not broken, this one's cracked, this was the problem in production. Because you've got lots and lots of pieces going through the factory. Clay, before it's fired and glazed, is quite breakable. It's still breakable, but in greenware, it's very breakable. This tail would crack off a lot of the time. And so they finally had to redesign this panther and incorporate the tail into the leg and solve the problem. 
But that's what our challenge is. It's always solving the problems. Royal Hickman was a real genius. He was an amazing, amazing artist. He had designed in crystal and glass, <coughs> excuse me, in wood. And uh, he and my father were best friends. And he worked for Hager for a number of years. And then they had a falling out. And that was during the war. And we couldn't get supplies during the war needed to produce some of the pieces. And Hickman was very upset because if he didn't get the production out, he didn't get all his royalties. So he wanted my father to pull some strings and do some other things. And dad said, no, we have to honor the war effort. So Hickman left after calling my father a son of a bitch. <laughs> And my father said, I have never before or since been called a son of a bitch. Well, they patched it up years later, and Hickman actually did come back to Hager and did many, many more designs over the years, uh, but on a freelance basis. And so they really they put Hager on the map. Then we got into the era of Eric Olson. Eric Olson was the designer of this very, very famous Red Bull and there was a matador that also goes with it, and he's flourishing his cape. It's just a marvelous set. And uh, we have, I know we have the matador somewhere, but it's not in the case right now. I don't know why. So this has been another iconic piece for Hager. And also, the, these particular two colors, the old Hager red and the Hager ebony, have been two of the most popular colors in all our history. It just continues to be very, very popular. Then uh, my father uh, continued on, and he developed lamps, um, Royal Hager Lamp Company. And we still have lamps in production today. We have many figurines, planters, of course, ashtrays, no more. But uh, <laughs> and those were extremely popular through the years. And unfortunately, I can't show you and represent all the different glazes that have been produced through the years. But if you do wish to come to Hager and see a little more, there is a wonderful book that has been written about us. Now what we make, uh, along with the lamps and figurines and so on, and planters and so on, we have gone into bakeware because baking in the home and cooking in the home is becoming extremely popular again. And these things really work well. So we have a pizza stone. Everybody loves pizza. And the pie plate. Can you see? I'm sorry, I'm blocking you here. And then we have different baking dishes. Again, I didn't bring the full line because my poor husband couldn't carry it all. But it's, uh, it's a wonderful challenge that continues to go on. And uh, we sell all across the United States and in foreign lands. Not terribly much in the export, but still it's picking up. And uh, so you can see us in Cracker Barrel and Crate and Barrel and Sears and Pennies and Target and uh, Pampered Chef. For any of you ladies that might know Pampered Chef, we make a great deal of their ceramic ware for them. So um, it's an exciting time for us. We're expanding the bakeware line. And um, I would like to introduce my husband. Craig Zachrich. I'm the uh, box carrier. <laughs> <laughs> He's also the chief operating officer who has really taken over the company now. And so we're keeping it all in the family. And uh, I get to semi-retire and do more other kinds of things that uh, I've been finding pretty interesting. So this is Hager. And we'd love to invite you down to the factory, just as I say, four blocks down the the bike path and uh, come and see. We have a museum there and uh, it, it shows you a lot of the pieces and the representative kinds of things that have been done over the years and the different designers. Our current designer is Kevin Bradley who actually we just saw in the parking lot at Hager. He's working on some molds today and some designs that have to get ready for production. So it's, uh, it's an exciting time. It really is and I thank you for being here with us today and sharing this. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Yes, ma'am.